I would say the last 18 to 24 months, we've been focusing on building that team uh, where we can start delegating and having, uh, you know, other leaders uh, lead other teams and processes, allowing for us to focus on a little bit more of the strategic side of the business. But definitely, I mean, you know, once once you get to certain to a certain point, it's it's something you need to to think about. You know, building a team around yourself. It's it's something that um, it needs to happen. It needs to happen. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. If you're a fan of the show, or even if you've listened to an episode or two. We would love to hear from you. Give us some feedback. Give us your honest feedback at that, just so we can make sure that the show is working hard for your investing goals, but also we'll take those notes that can help us make the show work better for you. And listen, if this is your first time listening or you're an avid listener, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. We've got a great show today. We're going to be talking to Daniel Angel. Mejia. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the Mastermind button today. Daniel Angel Mejia is the head of the finance management team at Apex Management. Now, with 10 plus years of experience in real estate development and investments across diverse asset classes, he holds a bachelor's in business administration from Georgia State University. Now, today he supervises his firm's capital generation fund and investor relations strategies. Let's welcome to the show, Daniel Angel Mejia. John, thanks so much for having me. A pleasure to Absolutely. be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, it's great to have you on the show. I went over your bio at a very high level. Why don't you take two minutes and fill in some of the gaps? Of course, John, uh, and thanks for that. Uh, you, you know, you kind of like touched on the uh, most important points. Uh, originally in, from Colombia, South America, born and raised, uh, went to the States for school, as you mentioned, went to Atlanta, Georgia State University. Uh, my career comes more from the uh, finance world. Uh, so when I finished uh, in school, I went back to Colombia, worked for a couple of uh, uh, corporate banking uh, companies, and then got into the more institutional real estate world in Colombia. Uh, that was more like for nine years. And then I had the opportunity to get back to the States, specifically with a Colombian company, different industry, but uh, coincidentally back to Atlanta. Uh, I didn't want to get like too far from the real estate world and started doing some investments on, on my own. Uh, single family, straight flipping. Uh, that was back in uh, mid to late 2015. Um, and that's where everything kind of like started uh, later on, a couple of years later, met who is my business partner today at Apex. And together we decided that uh, we wanted, we didn't want that to be more like a, that side gig, uh, individual investments here and there. We wanted to, to get uh, into a larger, I guess, uh, market, uh, decided to get into more like a rental space within the single family space. And later on, we learned more about multifamily and that that's the transition we've been making since pretty much late 2019 up to today. I love it, man. You talked about growing up in Colombia, moving to the United States to go to school, um, you know, getting a job with a company that was based in Colombia, actually moving home and then coming back out to Atlanta uh, where you're kind of based now. And I know as we're recording here, actually back in Colombia, but your your home is in Atlanta. Uh, and you talked about, you know, staying in the banking world, you know, getting in the banking world, but having a, you know, a close ties to real estate, growing in real estate, building your own portfolio, and then eventually launch an apex with the business partner where you're at today, kind of growing this business. Um, first of all, I think it's incredible when you think about just that journey, you know, and, and what it takes to kind of move countries and and get things started and kind of going back home. And I know you've got some different ties in Atlanta, but I think it's really important to understand kind of the, the makeup of your approach. So when you were in the banking world um, and started investing on the side, what sparked you to begin investing in real estate in general? Yeah, of course. Um, 
I think the the the, the real estate kind of spice um uh, triggered when when I was in working for those investment uh, companies in Colombia. Um, I learned a lot from different asset classes, uh, different than residential, uh, by the way. Uh, but but I I just saw a a great way to create a long term uh, strategy uh, for like wealth creation and and just uh, being able to uh, you know see that growth and 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 in in a way find that like financial freedom which usually is what you're kind of like looking for uh, when you get into that uh, professional world and and approach. Uh, later on, when I was in Atlanta, <clears throat> as I mentioned, like in a different industry, I didn't want to get like so much distracted. And, and I just thought it was a good opportunity to initially just learn about the local market, uh, learn learn about the residential space and, and whatnot. I found there was a pretty, pretty substantial distress still. Even it was 2015, but there was still distress. And I, I just found there were opportunities even with what I what I had on my own to begin with, I found that it was enough to start, and I just thought it was you know a good opportunity to get that going and see see where that would take me. Yeah, so you kind of around these other groups, right? And you're in the investment banking space, so you're seeing how other firms, other families are investing, and that kind of sparks your interest in real estate move into Atlanta, you recognize that there are a lot of distressed properties and you could take advantage of kind of the market and the market knowledge you built at that point. Um, given the fact that you, you know, obviously went to school in the United States, but, um, you know, born and raised in Colombia, did you run into any issues like getting approved for loans or uh, anything like that when you started to invest in real estate in the States? Yeah, of course. I mean, I wouldn't say it was necessarily because I wasn't from the states, uh, definitely being an, an immigrant, it's it's a little bit uh, harder just to to get uh, more more than I I wouldn't it wouldn't be fair to say I found it, like any friction in in that regard. It's more like uh, for me to get adapted to a new culture, new environment, new you know new ways of doing things. Um, but it was a you know pretty interesting learning curve. Uh, I think it. As, as usual, like the first is the hardest. Uh, once you get past that, it's usually smoother. So getting that first line of credit, getting getting acquainted into like the, the whole process and learning how the, how it would go and what you need, what I needed to, to get that first project going. Uh, I think it was the largest challenge at the time. Uh, later on, obviously, once we started getting to larger stuff, you, you find new challenges. But I think that first one's like the I think the most important to get past and get through once you once you do that. Uh, in, in my experience, it, it was just uh, awesome. I think that's a great point. Like you know, uh, too often people try to see the entire business plan right and look five, ten years in the future. And, I, and don't get me wrong, I think it's great to have big goals, but sometimes you just don't know what that next step is going to be. And just focusing on what you can do and that next step and you know, it's going to be hard. You're going to face challenges. You're going to face roadblocks. Power through that. And once you figure out those challenges, now you can make sure that the next deal, you take those learnings and you can grow and scale. Uh, for you, you mentioned that you had a partner, right? So once you were doing your own deals, you decided to partner up and kind of launch Apex. What was it about your partner that you felt um, was a good draw and also decide made you decide that, hey, you know what, let's work together. Let's build a company and let's partner up here. Of course, and and honestly, I think it has to do a lot with what you just mentioned about um, you know having that long term plan, but being able to execute and at some point just decide to go for it. Uh, I found in my business partner Daniel Gonzalez actually he's he's also from Colombia. Uh, so on one side, we just found there was a lot of uh, you know common points and common ground to get that uh, you know partnership started. But also once we started working together, just finding uh, in him a, you know, like true entrepreneurial mind uh, and that uh, ability of setting long term aggressive goals, but also being able to break that down into, OK, uh, there's 20 or 30 or 40 
you know, line items that we don't know how to do or how to approach, but let's just, you know, put that in order and start one by one. Uh, I found there was, uh, you know, we were very similar in that regard. Uh, and that's how it's been since, since we started, uh, since we started working together at the time he had done some, uh, flips. He used to live in Miami at the time I was living in Atlanta. We were doing the same thing, different markets. And, uh, we just found maybe Atlanta would be a better fit for that, uh, next step. And, uh, at that point we were trying to get, or we, we were starting apex in the single family space with some uh, private equity funds that we were trying to put together to get uh, portfolios going. Uh, a lot of things that we already knew, a lot others that we didn't have any idea of how to get our, I guess, heads around. Uh, but, you know, once we started working together and, and, and finding that, that common ground was, was powerful. Are there any skills or abilities that you felt your partner Daniel had that complemented what you were bringing to the table? Of course. Uh, and I think that's a very important thing whenever you're, uh, you know, starting a business uh, with with a partner. Uh, in, in this case, his negotiation skills, uh, he's very, you know, down to earth. And um, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I know how to say that in English, but uh, just, uh, you know, just his negotiation ability. It's, it's, it's just awesome. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, right? Anytime you're going to partner with someone, they should be bringing something to the table that that you don't have or that you just need help with, right? Or maybe it's something that you're just not strong at. So instead of trying to be average at something, just you know, go from bad to average and invest a bunch of time trying to learn something, you can partner with somebody who has that ability. And the thing that's cool is that you mentioned you both were kind of working on similar things. So he was in a different market. You decided to partner up, work together, and ultimately launch Apex. Uh, how did you all meet? Did you did you meet in the United States, or was this a relationship from Colombia? Like, how did you all get to know each other? Yeah, uh, we met in the states. Uh, just uh, someone in, in common just uh, put us together, and uh, but it was in the states. We were, we were born and raised same city, and we never never had a chance to talk before. <laughs> Uh, it's funny, you can move uh, thousands of miles away, right, to uh, to meet totally. and connect. <laughs> exactly. I love it, man. Um, so talk to me now about Apex, right? You mentioned that you started with residential, doing some flip projects, some single family rentals. Now your folks are more on commercial. What was the driver to kind of transition from residential real estate investing to commercial? Yeah, and, and I think uh, that's exactly how we did that first part, you know, single family flips, transition into uh, putting together some portfolio, stabilizing that. And the the reasoning behind the taking that sec the next step and the transition into multifamily was basically, you know, scale, growth, uh, and and finding in multifamily a, a good, as, you know, pretty good, uh, inelastic asset class uh, that allows us uh, that specifically scale, ability to growth, and uh, a lot of operational efficiencies as what we mainly have found. No, I think that's really great to know. And that's one of the reasons, you know, people are attracted to commercial, you know, it gives you that scale. It allows you to have some efficiencies when it comes to operations and also to run more like an effective business. Uh, speaking of your business right now, like just talk to us about kind of the framework, like, you know, I know you're in Atlanta. Are you only focused on Atlanta? What kind of properties are you typically looking at? Give us a little bit more about what Apex is focused on today. Yeah, of course. So yeah, today uh, we consider ourselves like fully transitioned into the multifamily space. We already full cycled all our single family uh, portfolio. Uh, it was a, you know, great ride, great, um, you know, stepping stone for that next uh, step and in, in getting into multifamily. Uh, we are focused in Metro Atlanta as of now. We believe in being like boots on the ground, knowing the market and being close to the asset. So our, our team in, in Atlanta is uh, local and, and we're, we're uh, here to, you know, to, to stay. Um, from that single family experience, we developed a, a very, you know, strong project management team. Most of our assets and our uh projects are value add. So there's a pretty interesting uh, renovation component to that. So we keep that 
uh, it's a you know project team in house, and um, pretty much is is how we uh, structure our our deals today. Something that we're mainly focused on uh, at this time is assets you know eighties vintage and up. Anything that has some kind of value add opportunity um, in Metro Atlanta for now. Obviously, we're starting to look at other markets uh, because it's just natural for you to uh, start, you know, looking for expansion opportunities, specifically or especially in this kind of market where where waters are a little bit more turbulent. Um, and uh, but but that's basically where we're focused on right now. Okay. And talk to me about kind of um, the the team because you know we mentioned that you're you're in Columbia right now, but based in Atlanta. And I know you've got teams in both markets. So how's your team structure right now, and and how do you kind of run an international investment firm? Totally, uh, and that's a very good point, and it goes back to what you mentioned about uh, those uh, what what each partner kind of like brings to the table. So. Uh, I would say like we we break our company into like three macro uh, groups, right? One it being acquisitions and asset management. Daniel, my business partner, leads uh, those two departments. Uh, so he sources deals uh, as well as uh, manages the asset management group, um, which at the same time manages the property management team. Property management, we do with a third party company uh but basically it's um i guess led by that asset management team the second group is, i would say it's our project management team uh, the leader of that uh group is uh, manuela villa she's from colombia uh and she goes back and forth from colombia to the to the states but basically we run everything that has to do with project management uh, pre-construction, so anything that has to do with sourcing material and labor. And then my team is finance. So I break that team into like two subgroups, one being corporate finance, like the day-to-day -day operation, just keeping the lights uh, on, and uh, capital markets and investor relations. So in capital markets, we structure deals, underwrite deals, um, and then uh, investor relations, we have... Uh, I guess we deal with all anything that has to do with communication back and forth with invest, existing and new investors. Um, as far as like the two geographies, anyone that doesn't have to be on site uh, will be in Colombia. Uh, so we have a 14 people team in Colombia sitting in Medellin. We have an office uh, here. I'm, I'm in Medellin right now, as you mentioned. And then in the States, we have... Um, well, I live in, in Atlanta, Daniel lived in Atlanta also. And then anyone that's on site for specifically or primarily for the uh, project team is in, in Atlanta. No, it's very helpful, right? So it sounds like there are a couple of things, right? You break it up into three groups. One is focused on kind of the acquisitions uh, and the asset management. One is focused on the project management. And then kind of the third group is focused on kind of the finance and the investor relations side of things. Uh, with most of the team being in Colombia, but the folks who are, you know, in the in Atlanta, they're your boots on the ground, right? Those are the people who need to be at the property, your construction folks, anybody who physically needs to be, you know, at the property in yourselves. Uh, you all are headquartered in Atlanta. Um, you mentioned the, the project management team as well as the asset management team, and I, I may have missed the delineation between the two, at least in the way you look at it. So when you say project management versus say asset manager like we get the acquisitions but like what does a project management team do that maybe uh your partner doesn't do when it comes to the asset management side got it yeah and, that, and i think that's a very important uh distinction to make think about it like project management would be uh the team that uh handles the the value add program so it's more construction driven renovation driven and more like hands-on boots and ground at the asset um, or at the property, uh, just to, to avoid using asset there. Yeah, and yeah. then the asset management team is a more of a financial approach to the overall execution of the program. So asset management won't only focus on the renovation program per se. They will look at it at the at the project at a more holistic way, starting from that acquisition 
dealing with obviously the loan. If there's if there's a refi involved, they'll get involved, and then the day to day operation. I guess overseeing the day to day op operation from the property management side in terms of occupancy, you know, collections and everything that happens day to day. No, I think that's really helpful for people to to think about and understand. And I come from the corporate business world, right? I know you came from finance and the, th the way I think about it, just to kind of keep it somewhat easy is, you know, you typically have different departments, but the CEO is in charge of the whole thing, right? And that asset manager is more of that kind of CEO type role. I'm not saying it's exactly a CEO, but they have to understand you know, what's happening with the projects or the construction side of it. They have to understand the financing side of things and how the loans are structured. They have to understand, you know, the investor side. So they have to understand a little bit of everything so that they have this information to make informed decisions um, because that's really what the role requires, right? They have to understand right. how the whole thing is coming together. Um, whereas some other groups may lead and completely be responsible for one portion of it, say the project or the construction management side of it. Uh, but again, that, that asset manager is going to maybe give different feedback or different directions uh, based on what they know is going on throughout the entire project or the fact that, hey, we're trying to gear up for a refinance in 12 months or 18 months. So they may want to see things operating a little differently and may want to have a different game plan for that construction manager or for other aspects of the team. So uh, just to give people a sense of like when you're trying to scale and you hear terms like, project manager and asset manager and property manager. And for some people, one person is wearing every single one of those hats. But as you scale and you have different teams and third parties, now you start to, you know, siphon those into different silos where you still need someone who is driving the overall vision and the business plan. And that kind of gives you a sense of how it all comes together. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, and speaking about wearing different hats, I mean, up to certain points and not, too long ago, uh, Daniel and myself were still wearing multiple hats. We still do, uh, but the you know I would say the last eighteen to twenty four months we've been focusing on building that team uh, where we can start delegating and having uh, you know other leaders uh, lead other teams and processes, allowing for us to focus on a little bit more of the strategic side of the business. But definitely, I mean, you know, once once you get to certain to a certain point, it's it's uh, it, it's something you need to to think about. You know, building a team around yourself it's it's something that um, it needs to happen. It needs to happen. It, speaking about building a team, right? Like, talk to us about maybe those first hires because <clears throat> I think that's a challenge people always have. Is like you're ready to scale. Maybe you don't have the revenue coming in that you feel comfortable hiring people, but you also know that you can't really scale and get the revenue with the amount of work that's on your plate right now. So talk to us about kind of how you and your partner came to grips with scaling, hiring folks, and ultimately adding these folks to the team. Absolutely. And um, and I think there's there are a couple of things to have in mind also. Once, once you actually decide to have those first hires where you originally think like, well, yeah, once I hire someone, that's it. They'll, they'll handle it. They'll deal with it. You, you need to also account for that uh, knowledge transfer or that transition period while you have, um, you know, even if they come from the same industry, even if, they're, if they know about, you know, what you're talking about or what they're going to be dealing with. Uh, understanding the specificity of your company takes some time. So just, you know, in our experience, just it's important to have that in mind. But going back to your question in terms of like, you know, those first hires, like where, how, where to choose or who to pick. In our case, what honestly, what we have done is uh, picture the ideal structure, even if it's for a few years down the road. And once you have that image, go back and decide where those priorities are, whether it is, whether it is because you are not so good at something and you need to bring an expert, you know, in our case, projects, you know, you know, he's not an engineer. I'm not an engineer. We know about renovation just because we've done it, but bringing experts and professionals in the matter is, is crucial. And that was our first uh, hire, uh, you know, someone that could handle uh, projects and deal with the, that day to day 
as well as structure a team for that process, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the same way for someone else, but that was, in, in our case, uh, that was our experience. And then after that, it's like the, determining like wh where the other priorities come and then the second, third, and then it just goes on and on. <laughs> yeah, I love your vision, your, your point on the vision, right? Of making sure you have a sense of what does this company look like 10 years from now? And then how do we start taking the first steps today towards building that company? Um, you know, when, when I talk to folks about scaling a business, one of the things that always comes up is, you know, one, a lot of times they, they just know kind of how much money they want to make or, you know, just the, the end game, but not really like the ethos of the company, the values of the company, like what they stand for and some of those different kind of things. And that makes it hard when you're making, when you're making hiring hires, right? Because you don't know what you're looking for. Exactly. You're just looking for a project manager. So you see project managers, okay, great. Um, how did you kind of manage that, right? When you talk about the company culture and talk about fit, and especially since you do have an international component where the two heads of the organization are based in the States, but most of your employees are, you know, in uh, Columbia. How did you, how do you kind of manage and control and kind of curate the company culture? So when you're making these hires, these are people who fit what you see for Apex Investments. That's a great question, and 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 to be quite honest, like at the beginning, we we have we think we've been uh, very visionary in that regard, and and trying to think ahead. Uh, and one of the questions that early on came up is like, okay, once we start having a team, like what kind of culture do we want? And that's a hard one at the beginning because it's like, I don't know, we we're pretty much workaholics, and we're at it every day but one thing's when when it's your business and other things when it's for the team it's uh it, you know there's always a culture i guess process that has to happen before you can determine like what kind of culture you can actually have or or build so that was a question that we weren't able to answer precisely at the beginning and we just kind of like had to go a little bit with the flow in terms of like let's try to find someone uh and for those two or three first hires uh that can fit our vision initially more than a culture because there's no real culture initially once we feel fine with that initial team that we have then we can see how that culture starts uh kind of like evolving right uh and then we found at the end of today now that we are you know, roughly 20 people in the team. It's a pretty, pretty young team, uh, you know, mission driven, you know, result oriented. And, and that's kind of like what we want now that we understand, you know, once you start connecting those dots of like, this is the vision, this is the team that we have built. And that's where, you know, common, common, I guess, traits start to appear within the team. Then that's where we kind of like found ourselves defining a culture. Uh, it was hard to de determine that at the beginning. Oh, Daniel, I, I know this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs are dealing with, how to scale, how to create a culture, how to hire the right folks. So that's something that, you know, we'll continue to work on, but I appreciate the way you look at it because sometimes you just have to make those hires and then kind of look at it and say, okay, what kind of company culture are we forming? Is this aligned with what our vision is? And then what adjustments can we make to make sure we're steering this in the right direction? So I appreciate you sharing a little bit of how you're building Apex Investments. For folks who want to learn more, they can go to apexinvestments.us. Again, it's apexinvestments.us. Right now, Daniel, we're going to go to our round of insights. All right, give me a failure or an apparent failure that set you up for later success. Um, I think, you know, in, in, in the initial steps of uh, Apex, you know, there was like in late 2016, uh, the market started getting a little bit uh, weaker on, you know, at, at the time we were single family selling, selling, you know, flips and whatnot. Um, and we were starting to get, you know, a chunkier inventory and not being able to rotate that. At the time, it felt uh, kind of hard to, to get past that. And, um, you know, it, at the end of the day, it, 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 it turned out into what we transformed into our uh, rental portfolio. 
So initially, it looked at uh, at, at as like a failure or like a hard moment, and we were able to pivot and transform it into what ended up being our uh, stabilized portfolio and our stepping stone for what we are today. So I guess my point there is more like uh, sometimes it, it requires looking at things from different angles and understanding that the challenges that you have, challenges that you encounter along the way are most of the time will be probably your, I guess, forced push for that next step. Uh, and just what, what I learned from that is just being flexible enough to pivot around uh, situations that, that, that you don't have control over. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Um, in our case, now that we're at, at a point where um, equity is an important source, we're, we're using uh, Zoom Info and, and their platforms. That's been pretty, pretty helpful. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Uh, who Not How. It's a great book there. All right, give me your number one. I'm sorry. Uh, give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Uh, wake up early. <laughs> All right, love it. What time do you wake up? 5.30 usually. Okay. All right. Give me your number one insight for scaling an international business. Uh, well, in, in our case, uh, it's been, you know, being familiar with uh, where our main team is. Uh, fortunately enough for us, it, it's our home country, so it's a little bit backwards in that regard. Um, and, and just because that's where our most of our team sits. But then on the other end, uh, getting familiar with the market and, and just networking is, is a key. All right. Well, you are uh, in Columbia today, but based in Atlanta for the most part. So let's use Atlanta here. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Ah, uh, 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 what's the name? Little, little steak. I uh, forgot the name, but it's a steakhouse in in Roswell. Uh, little little alleys, little alleys, steak. Little alleys. Okay, sounds like a good choice, man. Uh, we'll have to keep that on the list the next time we're in Atlanta. But I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, great information. I appreciate you sharing your story, right? Of coming from Columbia, you know, going to school in the states, and ultimately building a real estate portfolio, partnering up with your your partner now to launch Apex Investments and just some of the challenges that you all faced early on, scaling a business, going from residential to commercial multifamily and managing an international team that's allowing you to scale today. Again, for folks that want to learn more, they can go to apexinvestments.us. Daniel, I want to thank you again for coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you and I hope you have a great day. John, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to uh, talk to you and learn more about uh, you guys too. Uh, and thanks again. Hope to be absolutely. back soon. Yep. Take care, man. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye.